welcome 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 what an honor it is to have you choose to spend some time with us my name is nash warogolo and i'm the lead pastor of journey village out in kikuyu we are so excited to share this online experience with you but more than sharing this online experience with you we want to invite you to also be a part of it by participating one of the simplest ways for you to participate is by giving your tithes and offering is the number th uh, that is going to be shared on the screen uh, and then number two we have an pastor who is eagerly awaiting to join you in the circumstances that you are in and so if you are there and you have a prayer need we would love 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 to stand with you in prayer if you are there and it's about celebration for you we are crazy about celebration so would you please share with us your celebration and we'll be joining you and then finally, we don't just want to share this experience with you. We want to invite you to contribute to the conversation. And so throughout the worship experience, maybe something in the song captures your heart. Please type it out on the comments. Maybe something within the message will connect with you. Please, again, on the comment section, just type it out. Let us know that we are not just the ones on the screen, but you are on the other side of the screen. And now for the next 45 or so minutes, we'll have some time of singing, some time of reading scriptures, some time of sharing a message, time, time to pray and to be together. And I can't wait for you to enter into what it looks like. Prepare your hearts as you join us. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have seen in the goodness of god And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God hey, yeah, yeah. Your goodness Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, God, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered. Hey 
will sing of the goodness of God. People of the village, um, we are so, so blessed that you could join us today. Um, we are going to spend some time reading scripture for um, our, our session together today. And our scripture is taken from Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 15. But before we get into our scripture reading for the day, I would like to invite us to give. It is your generous contributions um, and your generosity that allows us to be here and to do what we are doing to uh, be able to reach people um, with the gospel of Jesus. So I would like to invite you to give the number. Our paper number will be on your screen. So if you could take some time and do that as we get into our scripture for the day, which I will say again is Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 15. And I read, after Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Oh, sorry, actually, that's verse 1. <laughs> Suppose you read verse 11. Okay, so verse 11. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. That is Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 15. I hope you have had an opportunity or a chance to give. The table number will be on the screen, and we're just going to continue in our time of musical worship together, so please join us as we do so. Hey, hey, Wewe ni mwema Wema wako si kwa wakati wa furaha tu Wema wako pia wakati hata wa majonzi Wema wako haupimi Majira fulani tu Wema wako Ni kila wakati Na kila nyakati hey, hey. Hata sasa ni mwema oh, oh. Tunapoimba ni mwema Tunapolia hey. Tunapolia ni mwema Majirafu lani tu 
wemawa to nikilawa kati na kilanya kati hata sasa wewe ni mwema hata sasa ni mwema tunapoimba ni mwema tunapolia eh tunapolia ni mwema tunapotea oh tunapocheka ni mwema tunapopanda ni mwema tunapopanda ni mwema eh eh tunapovuna ni mwema wewe ni mwema eh wewe ni mwema Thank you. 
such a joy to be with you in this format. Uh, even with its limitation, it still allows us to participate in enjoying and sharing of, of the good news. Uh, and speaking of participation, we want to keep reiterating this. Uh, if you get connected, a certain line or something comment touches you, please just go to our comment sections and let us know that you are on the other side of the screen. Uh, now, before we pause last week for celebrations, we had started this conversation on compassion, you know, and, and really the idea that we were grappling with is what might the Holy Spirit be inviting us to uh, in this uh, season of life that we find ourselves, that the Holy Spirit, we are convinced, is still uh, empowering and inviting and drawing us into something to participatory life with him regardless of whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in. And for us, we concluded that that may actually be that the Holy Spirit is drawing you and you, you and I to be a compassionate people. That we live in this world that is so deeply steeped in suffering and pain and loss, and maybe God is at the same time looking for people to join him in these redemptive purposes. If God is still at work, we are deeply convinced that he is longing to have a people who seek to be a vessel of goodness, a vessel of faith, a vessel of hope, and a vessel of love to all those around us who need it desperately. So you are exploring this idea of being invited by the Holy Spirit to be a people of compassion. And the last time we talked about John Philip Newell, who in his book, uh, The Rebirthing of God, talks of compassion as being with suffering. Being with suffering. And, so he, and also he proposes a sort of a three-pronged way uh, towards becoming and embodying this compassion towards joining God with his compassionate heart. And John Philip talks of the courage to see, the courage to feel, and the courage to act. The courage to see, the courage to feel, and the courage to act. And so last time we spent some time exploring the centrality of seeing in the process of cultivating compassion. And we say that really that how and what we see determines how we feel you and ultimately determines how we respond. The how we see and what we see determines how we feel and shapes eventually how we respond. And therefore seeing is central to compassion. But at the same time as we talk of seeing being central to compassion, I think feelings as well our capacity to feel. And so today we want to spend some time exploring this idea that we need the courage to feel if we are going to be a people of compassion. 
And we want to anchor our conversation and ourselves this morning in the story that Modoni read uh, about Jesus showing up to this particular town with his disciples and a crowd of followers. And as they get into this town, they bump into this sort of burial procession, this funeral procession. And we're told that this funeral is of a young man who is an honest son to sort of to this widow, you know. So she's like literally the last family member of this widow. And this means that as they, they are witnessing this procession, it is not any other funeral procession. It's a procession for this widow, this woman to almost bid goodbye to his only other sort of immediate family. And Luke tells us uh, that Jesus looking at this, you know, he sees the woman and I guess sees her in her pain and in all her loss. And it says next is that he has compassion for her and he says to her, do not weep. And we know that he goes on then, according to the story, to raise the child to life and had him over back to his mother. But I hope you cut that line, which is so easy to miss. Uh, and it's like, Literally, that woman, see, Jesus sees this woman in her sorrow, in her agony, in her mourning, in her grief, and he has compassion on her. And then moves towards the raising of this child, this son, to life that he sees, and then he's moved in compassion. And in other uh, translation of the same passage, especially in the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson tells us that when Jesus sees this woman, you know, his heart broke. That when Jesus, when Jesus sees this woman, his heart breaks. You know, when he sees her in the agony, when he sees her in the pain, when he sees her in the grief, when he sees her and sees the potential future of this woman going on through life as an only remaining member of her own family, his heart breaks. And we define compassion, back to John Philip, as being with suffering. And I think a part of being with suffering is literally having our hearts broken by the suffering. I think part of that is like letting our hearts feel the suffering around us to the point where it breaks us and then moves into action. I, I could argue that there is no compassion without broken hearts. Or oh, another way of framing that is that there is no compassionate action or compassion-driven action without our hearts being broken. You know, another space, it says, you know, that still talking about Jesus is uh, comp having compassion on a group of people. This time around, it's these kids who have been with him for three days, right? And in this case, I think this is Matthew telling us, it says that when uh, Jesus wasn't finished with this particular crowd of people, and so he calls the disciples and he says to them, I heart for these people. That is in Matthew 15, verse 32, you know, that I heart for these people because for three days these people have been with me and they have nothing to eat. And I can't send them away without a meal because they'll probably collapse on the road. And you capture that again, again, as Jesus sees these people who have been with him and he notices more importantly that they have been with him without something to eat for three days. He hurts for them. His heart again breaks for the sake of these people. And because his heart breaks, he then gathers his disciples and says, what are we going to do about this? You know, Mozoni, my, my wife, he met, I mean, she met Mozoni. She met uh, with a dear friend who deeply cares for this place that we call Kikuyu. You know, and so this dear friend has done so much to better the, this place uh, by partnering with different uh, government authorities and businesses and all sorts of well wishes to address the myriad of challenges that Kikuyu town and its larger environment faces. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, before she has all these amazing stories of all the things she has been able to do for this place, there was a trench. You know those sort of trenches on the side of the road that are meant to sort of act as, as, a, as a way of, of you know, letting the, the, the flood water sort of flow, the rainwater sort of flow past, you know? So for this girl, there was this 
particular trench in her neighborhood. Uh, and every time it would rain, you know, it, the, the trench, of course, it will flood or whatever, but then the trench will fill up with trash. And when the trench filled up with trash, it meant that the water couldn't flow, something that I think we are experiencing deeply <laughs> uh, during this rainy season. And so this trench will fill up with trash, you know, whatever plastic bags or whatever it is, and then it will clog up, which means that water would pass, which means that the entire neighborhood will be flooded. But then, you know, at some point, there will be these guys who would come, and sort of, you know, maybe from the city council or Kikuyu council, whoever knows, and they will clear up, sort of they will dig up the trash away from the trench. But instead of carrying the trash away, they will sort of line it up on the edge of, of sort of the trench, you know. So on one side, the trench will look very clear and clean and nice and water can flow again, but then the trash will be heaped on the edges uh, of this particular trench. And of course, you know how this cycle goes, right? Because the next time it floods, you know, it rains rather, the rainwater drags the, trench, the trash back into the trench, the trench gets uh, clogged up, the neighborhood floods again, and this go went, would go on, on, and on, and on, and on. And my friend got to a place that it's just like her heart, again, was broken by the inability of these people to fix this seemingly simple problem. Her heart was broken, and she was frustrated, and she was angry. But notice this, because she allowed her heart to be broken because of this one trend that all these people within the neighborhood passed by, she was moved to do something about it. So she decided, you know what, I'm going to track down whoever is responsible for overseeing this particular trench, and I'm going to almost make them do what they're supposed to do. But her action was motivated by her heart that was broken. She had to feel, and not just feel casually, but feel deeply for her to set an appointment at all these sort of different offices. And that is how her heart to sort of redeem uh, this place started. And I think we have so many stories of that, that the very place when we allow our hearts to be broken open by whatever suffering that we bump into, it becomes a thing that then moves us in towards compassionate action. And so again, there is no compassionate action without broken hearts. Starting with Jesus, who sees this window and then she is moved by compassion. Her heart is broken with compassion. Starting with Jesus, who looks at these people who have been faithfully following him and notices that they are hungry and again, his heart breaks, he hurts for them, and so he moves towards compassionate action. Literally, feeling and our capacity to feel can be the thing that defines whether we get the courage to then move with compassionate action. Which, of course, as you can see, bring is revolves around this uh, term that I don't know how comfortable you are with it. As a man, I am not. This word, feelings. And connected to feelings, I guess, is emotions. And I don't know how comfortable you are to feel, and not just feel casually, but to feel deeply, to let our hearts be broken. You know, there is this ancient uh, sort of folk rock music team, you know, and I say ancient because a lot of us, I'm sure, have never heard of them. They are called Simon and Garfunkel. You know, I don't, I'm sure I pronounced that right, and my father-in-law will be correcting me in due time, you know. But in Simon and Garfunkel, this team, they have this fascinating song that is called, I Am a Rock. And although they are talking primarily about romantic feelings and how they are rocks as men, I mean, I think it may have something to do and to say to us in wrestling with our, 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 our struggle to feel and feel deeply. And here's some of the lyrics of the song. And it says, I am a rock. I am an iron. I have built walls, a fortress deep and mighty that none may penetrate. I have no need for friendships. And the reason I don't have need for friendships is because friendship causes pain. And me, it's laughter and loving that I disdain. Again, I am a rock. I am an island. Don't talk to me of love. But I've heard of the word before. It's slipping in my memory. And this is a clincher for says, I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died. 
I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died. If I ever loved, I would never have cried. And I think this gives us a hint about all our struggle with, with feelings, whether it's with suffering or around romantic feelings. It's the same thing, you know, that we have sort of loved. We have sort of let our hearts open and it has been crushed and broken. And so it's no wonder we want to move to build a fortress around it. No wonder we don't want to feel. No wonder we don't want to allow our hearts to be broken. And it's fascinating because I think it's still we have to be honest about what that means. That we just are not denying our feelings. We just are not denying feeling deeply, having the courage to feel deeply with the suffering around us. As much as it is also true that we have experienced the pain of our hearts being broken. We have tried. We have cared about something and then corruption has swooped in it and we have felt so crushed. We have cared about, I guess, maybe some homeless people and all our efforts have come to naught as those people swam back into the streets. We have cared deeply about that one relative. We have poured our resources into them and then they have sort of trashed all their efforts in a life that would argue is reckless living. We are a people who struggle with feeling deeply, partially not just because we struggle with feeling, but partially because the moments when we have let our hearts be broken, the suffering has not necessarily been elevated, but has been left as more scarred. And so you and I prefer to build a fortress around our hearts. To build a fortress around our hearts. And so I've been wrestling with this idea of what is it that is going to move us to sort of risk opening up our hearts again? What is it that is going to challenge us to risk having our hearts broken? To risk letting our emotions run and roam free around us again? Because it's the only doorway into compassionate action. It's the only doorway into compassionate action. And so I've been grappling with what is it has, that has happened within my life, those few moments when I've sort of risked letting my heart be broken once again. And I landed on this rather, and I'm sure there are many more reasons why we struggle with our feelings. I'm sure there are people who have done a lot better articulation of these kind of problems than I am going to do. So I just want to focus on just one little component that I think is central to our struggle, uh, to allow ourselves to feel, feel in a way that may move us into compassion, uh, move us away from numbing our, feed, our feelings, move us away from uh, sort of building a fortress of all our, around our feelings, but literally join Jesus in noticing those around us who long for us to see them through the eyes of compassion and to respond in compassion. And one of the ideas that I landed on is because we sort of came to this moment uh, through our best efforts of loving and failing and risking and having our feelings hurt, I was just wondering whether in all the uncertainty and chaos that engulfs our world, I wondered whether the biggest challenge we face is that the world is so brutal and has been so brutal with our feelings and we have risked them out that we don't have any sense of safety anymore. That we don't have safe places, safe people where we can allow our feelings to come out. And I landed on this idea of, of home, right? You know, I don't know what your experience of home is, but home at its best becomes the place where we, we sort of are accepted for who we are more than what we bring or don't bring to the table. Home at its best becomes a place where we are loved unconditionally. It becomes a place where we belong, right? And I think as a result of this acceptance and as a result of this belonging, we experience this same sense of rest. And I think from that place of rest, we feel safe enough to risk letting our feelings and emotions run wild. 
And so in conclusion, I just wondered if the greatest struggle we face with allowing ourselves to feel the suffering around us as deeply as we need to feel it so that we can move, we can be moved into compassionate action starts with finding a safe place to belong. I wondered whether our struggle to allow ourselves to feel the pain of those around us the struggles are of those around us, and to allow those struggles to move us into action. I wondered whether it's actually directly connected to our incapacity and lack thereof of safe spaces of safe people from where we can experience that sense of belonging, that sense of acceptance, that sense of rest that then allows us to risk letting our heart be broken again. So I guess the question we could might be asking is, who for you are safe people? And when you, you sort of see suffering around you, where do you take, where do you go to sort of navigate and process those emotions? You know, for some of us, maybe our families provide that sense of home. For a few of us, I'm sure, we, it's been so hard that we have had to procure the services of a professional person, a therapist, a counselor. And for some of us, I think we have friends that we go to. But my heart also breaks for those of us for whom we don't have any safe space, any safe people with whom we can show our hearts and risk allowing it to be broken. I think with so many of us are comfortable within our fortresses within our numbed reality as compared to risking, developing, cultivating the courage we need to let those around us who care deeply about us to also be a space where we can be honest and say, this is the thing that is breaking my heart and breaking my heart terribly. So maybe this morning the challenge I want to usher you is to ask, would you risk Cultivating the courage you need, the strength you need to find safe people, to find safe spaces. Would you be one of those people who risk again opening up your heart, opening up your home for it to be a safe space, a safe home for someone else who is desperate, for a place where they can feel safe enough to open up their hearts? And even as I invite you both to look for safe spaces and safe people and for you to be the kind of person who makes their hearts, their home, a home for someone else, I'm just basically inviting you to join the Trinitarian God. Because this is random verse, easy to me. It's in John, it's, uh, John tells, reports uh, Jesus saying this, uh, sort of, uh, John uh, 14, I think it's, it's in verse that, if I can find it, if you, oh, sorry, I'm just like finding this, this verse, uh, because in Jesus, uh, sorry, in John uh, verse 13, I mean John chapter 14 and verse 23, you know, John records Jesus saying these words from the uh, NIV that says, if anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, my father will love them, and we will come to them, and this is the creature, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. So I'm inviting you to find a safe space and a fine home to where our feelings can find uh, the, the, the necessary safety they need to come out. I'm just simply inviting you to join uh, Jesus and, Christ and God as they promised to make a home with us. But more importantly for you and I is to come to this place where we realize that maybe the greatest calling in our journey to being compassionate people is to more importantly make room, make room for God and his son and the Holy Spirit to move into our lives and make a home with us. Maybe the greatest challenge we face on our journey to being compassionate people is our incapacity to cultivate presence with a capital P. 
to cultivate a place where God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit can move and make home with us. And what a low-hanging fruit that is. And so as I invite the worship team back up, and as they sing this song, I just want to challenge you to wrestle with who are your safe people? Where are your safe places? Because as we are inviting you to have the courage to feel, you may have the courage to feel that then sinks you. And that's not what we are advocating for. We are advocating more for you to have the courage to feel from the safety of safe people, from the safety of a home. So maybe for you, who are your safe people? And number two, maybe you need to make room for someone else to also make home in your life. And then ultimately, most importantly, is that you will be someone who is open enough and make room big enough for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to move into your life and make a home with you. That safe space where you experience true acceptance, true belonging, and true rest from where you can let your heart be broken over and over and over by the suffering all around us because you are in a home. We will abide in you, Lord, hide in you, Lord, rest in you, Lord, rest in you, Lord, wait on you, draw strength from you. in you we will abide in you lord hide in you lord rest in you lord rest in you teach us to wait on you draw strength from you Quaco 
in John 15, verse 3, in the message version, Jesus is recording as, as if saying, live in me. Make your home in me as I do in you. And again, there it is, this invitation to make a home in the Trinitarian God. As I pray that as you navigate whatever the tensions there are in your life, that you will be the kind of a person who is doing the work to make a home. The promise of a home is not out there. The promise of a home is in Christ Jesus, in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we truly commit ourselves to you. And Lord, I want to believe that we all long to join you in having compassion on whoever we see, on those around us who are hurting, on those around us who are in pain, or those around us who are in great loss, Lord. We want to be a people who move, in, who are moved in compassion to action, Jehovah God. But there's this tricky part where the pathway to that is through feeling and allowing ourselves to feel deeply the suffering around us. And that's a risky thing in this world that we live in, to feel and to feel deeply. So I ask, Lord, for each one of us, that you wake us up to all the ways that you are offering us a safe space to belong a safe space of acceptance, a safe space of rest from where we can feel deeply and let our hearts be broken by all that is wrong and unjust in this our world. And as our hearts are being broken, may we move in action from that place. Father, Lord, be with us in all our ways. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And now to wrap up our service, really, I just want to send us out, rather me and the worship team want to send us out into a week with a blessing. And so I want to start us off and then invite uh, the team. And so, ah, my dearly beloved, may you come to know that your feelings, your emotions, your heart counts for something. May you do the work to cultivate the courage it takes to break down the walls, to break down the fortress that is so easy to build around our hearts. But as you do that, more importantly, may you be blessed with a home, a safe space, a safe people from where you can let your guard down and let your heart be broken once more. May you come to know a God who is longing with everything he has to come and make a home with you and may you make room for you and God to make that home together. As you go into this coming week, may the favor and blessing of God be upon you. And how they worship him. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you calm rejoicing at the wonder shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you
bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.